Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and the authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. We are launching a new series today from this book of the Bible called Colossians. It's called Grounded in the Gospel. And so if you've got your Bibles with you, turn uh, there. If you don't have Bibles, bring them with you next week or or use uh, the Bible app. But we're going to spend the next nine weeks taking a deep dive into the contents of this letter, which is really uh, Jesus 101. Paul is going to show us the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus, not only for our salvation, but for all of life. Jesus is sufficient for how we view the world, for how we walk through life, for how we conduct ourselves, for how we relate to others, for how we relate to our spouse, for how we relate to our kids, for how we work, and for our divine purpose and calling in this world. It's all from Jesus. It's all for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, before we get into this text, I just want to kind of give you a high-level background of how this letter came to be because it's a little bit different than the rest of Paul's letters in, in the New Testament. Paul's missionary journeys are recorded for us in the book of Acts, and his strategy was to enter into a city preach the gospel, people would respond to the gospel, then he would spend the next few weeks to few months equipping them, discipling them, training them, establishing a church, then appointing elders, and then leaving that city and going on to the next city to rinse and uh, repeat. And so seven of Paul's letters in the New Testament were written to churches uh, that he planted, First and Second Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians. The other two church letters uh, is Romans and Colossians. And he did not plant those churches. We know from his letter to the Romans that he did intend to visit that church. But for all we know, Paul never intended to visit the church at Colossae. Uh, Colossae was not a significant city at all, and we probably would never have heard of it had it not been uh, for this church there. So what's Paul's connection? Why would he choose to write a letter to this church? Because a letter from Paul was, that was a big deal to the early church. And you know, it's kind of a big deal to us because most of those letters make up our New Testament, which is where we get uh, our doctrinal distinctives as, as Christians, So let's talk about that for a few minutes. In Acts 19, on his third missionary journey, Paul goes to Ephesus, and he he hangs out in Ephesus for two years, and Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, says that he taught daily in the school of Tyrannus for for two years. He taught daily in the school of Tyrannus for two years, and then Luke says, and all of Asia, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. See, Ephesus is a major port city in Asia Minor, and people would come from all over the known world to Ephesus to trade goods uh, and services. And so Paul just hunkered down, and he taught the gospel daily because it was a prime opportunity for people to come and hear the gospel and to take the gospel back to where they came from. And so he did this for two years, every single day, didn't even have the Bible. Now, I'm worn out from teaching weekly. And I got the whole book, right? Paul didn't have a Bible. He didn't have Google. He did not have chat GPT, right? Which is how I write my sermons these days. (laughs) Just kidding. He's just teaching the ways of Jesus every single day. He's just teaching the truth of the gospel and how the gospel can change them. And so I just want you to imagine for, for a moment going to Ephesus 
Like you're, you're going to the city of Ephesus, you're there, imagine you've just arrived and you're walking through town, you're looking for a place to set up shop to sell your fake Rolexes or your, you know, your, your fake Gucci purses. And you hear a voice coming from inside as you walk by and, and this guy is talking about uh, how he was on the road to Damascus and he met Jesus there and you're intrigued because you've heard about Jesus, like somebody has talked about this guy who apparently rose from the dead, and you've heard some stories, but you don't really know what that's all about, and so you, you overhear this, and, and, and so you duck your head in because you're, you're intrigued, and he tells the story about how he was struck with blindness, and he couldn't see anything for three days. He had no idea where he was. He didn't know if this was a dream or if this was real. He hadn't eaten for three days. He's drank nothing for three days. He's dehydrated. And then a guy named Ananias comes to visit him. And you, you begin to just lean in as he tells the story. And Paul said, he called me by my name. Persecutor would have been appropriate Murderer would have been fitting because that's what I was, but yet this, this courageous Jesus follower who had only ever heard horror stories about me, he called me family. He accepted me as a brother, and he said, Brother Saul, that was my name back then, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared on the road, he has sent me to you so that you may receive your sight and receive the Holy Spirit. And as soon as he said that, like these scales fell from my eyes, and I could see, and I knew this was not a dream. I knew this was real. I knew that Jesus was real, and from that moment on, I committed the rest of my life to propelling this movement I'd given everything for to shut it down and then I was baptized the gospel changed me I'm not the man I once was and the gospel can change you too can you just imagine being there in the school of Tyrannus, and you hear Paul tell his story like if the flux capacitor actually worked. That's the place I would go to. I'd love to go to Ephesus and just hear Paul tell his story. I mean, it's a powerful read in Acts chapter 9 if you don't know the story, but to hear the man tell it himself, that would just be life-changing. And it was for a guy named Epaphras. This is likely where he met Paul, he had come to Colossae to trade goods and services. He heard Paul's testimony and he came back day after day and eventually he was just wrecked by the gospel and he gave his life to Jesus and he was discipled by Paul himself and eventually Epaphras leaves Ephesus and he goes back to his hometown, a little town called Colossae most likely as the very first Jesus follower in his town. And then Epaphras just starts to tell his story about how his life was wrecked by the gospel in a good way, about how it freed him from the trappings of this world, how it empowered him to live a new life, how it changed his character and made him completely new. And then one by one, friends and family, they began to surrender to the same Jesus and embrace the same gospel and a church was born in the little city of Colossae. And then a few miles down the road, it took root in a town called Laodicea. And another church was born. And then a few more miles down the road to a little town called Hierapolis. And another church was born. And Paul replicated his life by discipling this young man named Epaphras that later changed the landscape of three different cities. That's the impact of the gospel when we share it with others. So you are not the only Jesus follower in your town. But you may be the only one in your office you may be the only one on your street in your cul-de-sac. You, you may be the only one in your mom's group. You may be the only one in your family. And what would happen? What would happen if you just became an Epaphras and shared the gospel with those people? 
What would happen if you just told them how the gospel wrecked your life in a good way? Like you don't have to be a Bible scholar. Epaphras didn't own one because there wasn't one to own. What he had was a before and after story. What he had was a transformation story. And if you're a Jesus follower, see, you've got one of those too. Maybe it's a story about how you were living your life for your own pleasure and you were, you were just pursuing your, your own dreams and, and, and you, knew, you knew deep down this was the wrong direction. It wasn't giving you any joy. Maybe your story is about how your identity was wrapped up in your job, that what you did became who you were, and you were under this constant pressure to perform, to be better, to do better week after week. And maybe it's a story about how your marriage was on the brink of divorce. Maybe it's a story about how you were in a dark place of addiction, and then on your own road to Damascus, you met Jesus. That he pursued you and changed you, and now you've reoriented your life to pursue all of Jesus. See, who's God calling you to be an Epaphras to? Because somebody in your circle needs to hear the gospel according to you. They need to hear your story about how Jesus changed you. So let me just take the pressure off of you right now. Your job is not to change people. It's just to tell people how Jesus changed you. That's it. You are not responsible for changing anybody's life. I'm not responsible for changing anybody's life. Just to tell people how Jesus changed mine. You don't need to know everything about the Bible to share the gospel. You don't need to know how to explain the Trinity to share the gospel. And if you figure out how to explain the Trinity, you need to explain it to me, okay? You don't need to know the answer to every question someone may ask you to share the gospel. You just need to know Jesus. And other people need to know that you were once blind and now you see. That was the woman at the well that we talked about last week. She, she left and said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Come see a man who completely changed my life. See, Colossae was born, the church at Colossae was born because one man, one blind man regained his sight and then he helped another blind man regain his. That's disciples making disciples. I met a guy last week who's newer to Center Point and he was sharing with me how much the Holy Spirit has changed his life uh, since being here and I love hearing those stories about how God's working in the lives of people in this place. And he said, I'm having conversations with coworkers I've never had before. He said, one of my coworkers is starting to pray, and, and, and I'm hoping eventually to get her to come to church with me. He's just the Epaphras of his office, just, just sharing God's grace in his own life, what God has done in his own life. See, people can argue with religion all day long, but nobody can argue with a story of transformation. Nobody can argue your before and after story. So look for opportunities to share your story and be an Epaphras to people who are already in your sphere of influence. Your job is not to change them. It's just to tell them how Jesus changed you and you never know where that will go. It, it may eventually birth a church. And that's what happened in Colossae. That's how this church was born. And the impact of the gospel was making an impact, a broad impact in the kingdom. But there was a problem that was making its way into the church in the form of false teaching. So this church is only a few years old. These are brand new believers. These are babies in Christ. Uh, many of them probably converts from a pagan religion. Some of them were converts from Judaism, from the Jewish faith. And the Jewish converts were still holding on to portions of the law. They were teaching that Jesus alone isn't sufficient. It, you've got to have Jesus and. You need to have Jesus and circumcision. You need to have Jesus and the observance of holy days. Jesus and the observance of the diet code, which means Jesus and no bacon. I can you imagine? I've had it twice this week. Jesus and. Others were teaching that Jesus wasn't supreme. He wasn't actually God in the flesh because they had adopted this teaching where, where that, that stated that all matter is evil. All matter is evil. This table is evil because it's made of matter. 
This stage is evil platform, I'm sorry, is made of, is made of matter. My, my, my clothes are made of matter. My flesh is made of matter. All of this is evil. Therefore, God couldn't have taken on flesh because God can't intermingle with evil. Therefore, Jesus could not have been God. And so that was the teaching. It was called Gnosticism, comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. And they taught that salvation could only be attained when you uh, rid, rid yourself of matter by transcending to this greater state of knowledge, this greater truth within your own conscience. See, New, new Age thought is not so new. It's as old as Colossians. And here's the thing about Christianity. It rises or it falls on the identity of Jesus. If Jesus isn't sufficient and if Jesus isn't supreme, then Jesus can't save, which means we have no gospel. Who Jesus is and what he accomplished is paramount to the survival of Christianity then and now. Because what the church dealt with then, the church deals with now, there are people in our world who teach that Jesus is not supreme. You know some of them. All roads lead to heaven. You just pick the one with the prettiest drive. You just pick the one with the most scenic route. You just pick, pick the one that makes the most sense to you. You will get there. There are people in the world today that are teaching a Jesus and gospel. You need Jesus and works. You need Jesus and performance. You need Jesus and rules. Jesus alone is not enough. There, there are well-meaning, well-meaning, Jesus-believing people who are trying to add things to their faith because they're not convinced that Jesus is supreme and that Jesus is sufficient. So give me Jesus with a little bit of Buddha sprinkled in. And I'll be enlightened. Give me Jesus with some rules sprinkled on top and I'll be holy. So Epaphras, seeing the urgency of this issue and knowing what was at stake, he traveled 1,300 miles to the city of Rome to inform Paul of this issue and to get his help. And we know that he was in Rome from Paul's letter to Philemon that he wrote while he was in Rome. And at the end of the letter, he... he he talks about Epaphras being with him as his fellow prisoner. And so while Paul is under house arrest there in Rome, he is awaiting his trial before Nero. He penned this letter to a church he had never uh, visited, to a group of believers he had never met, to address this false teaching and to clear up the confusion about who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross. And so with that context, we're going to dive in to the first uh, 14 verses of uh, chapter 1. So here we go. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, stop. It's going to take us a long time to get through this. <laughs> Paul, an apostle. It's very important. Right off the bat... Paul lets them know where this message is coming from. And, and, and out of all the voices that you've been listening to that are trying to influence what you believe about Jesus, I am not writing to you as a man with an opinion. I'm writing to you as an apostle with authority. And so this right here, this word sets the tone for the rest of the letter. Paul is establishing credibility. Again, he's never met these people. Most of them have probably heard of Paul. Certainly they've heard of him from Epaphras. But Paul wants them to know, I'm writing to you as an apostle. Now the apostles, the 12 apostles, were men that had been with Jesus. They had spent time with Jesus. And Paul had this experience on the road to Damascus. And so he writes with authority. He speaks and writes with truth. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters. You guys are family. We're family together. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Very uh, standard greeting from Paul. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. And so the Colossian Christians were doing the only thing that Paul said counted. Remember what Paul said counted? The only thing, Galatians 5, 6. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. And so as Epaphras is 
downloading all these wonderful things to Paul. Paul just distills it down and says, here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing about your amazing faith in Jesus and the way that you love people. Like their faith in Jesus, they'd received the gospel, you were living out the gospel, you've reoriented your entire life around the gospel and around Jesus, and you were living for his glory and his honor, and the result of your faith is that it's being expressed appropriately in love. See, genuine faith in Jesus always translates into love for other people. Like if you love Jesus, you cannot help but love people. If you are struggling to love people, then there's a disconnect between you and Jesus. And that's got to get sorted out. But when we get this vertical relationship right, it just always translates into love for other people. They're serving one another. They're encouraging one another. They're praying for one another. They're bearing one another's burdens because that's what love does. And when Epaphras reports back to Paul, all of these wonderful things, like Paul says, here, here, here it is. It's faith in Jesus. It's love for people. And if someone were to report on Center Point, I hope that's what would stand out. That our unwavering faith in Jesus and our love for other people, I hope that's what they would say. I mean, more than, more than great music, more than really nice facilities and environments, more than our amazing programs for kids and students, and, and, and more than the average preaching. What? Below average? Gosh. Below average, okay. Doesn't matter. I want our mark to be the way we love Jesus and the way we love people because it's the only thing that counts. Now, I want you to notice what Paul is doing. This letter is about speaking the truth of Jesus and how does he start? Starts with grace, right? We talked about this last week, that grace and truth, we hold on to these things. He's going to get to truth but he just starts with grace. I mean, you guys are crushing it. You guys are doing so well, living out your faith and loving and serving people and it's making an impact in the kingdom. And so he goes on. He says, you've already heard about this hope and the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It's bearing fruit. It's growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. See, the gospel changes everything. The gospel means that we've been made right with God, made right with our Heavenly Father, not by our own effort, but by the grace of Jesus and his death on the cross. And the gospel is more than a future hope. It is a present reality. And there's coming a day when everything wrong with the world will be made right again. A day when sin will have no place in this world. A day when brokenness will have no part in this world. A day when God will wipe every tear from our eyes. That's the hope we cling to, that, that God is going to restore everything to its original setting where sin and death are eradicated and we will live in perfect unity with God and with each other. No sin, no sickness, no funerals, no tears. Like that's, that's the hope. But listen, We don't just trudge through life waiting for that day. That's not the point of the gospel. The gospel empowers us to live joyfully today, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of sorrow, because of Emmanuel, God with us. See, our faith is more than having the hope of heaven. It's living in the power of the resurrection. I mean, the hope of heaven would be enough, would it not be? (laughs) But it's even better than that. 
Like we live in the power of the resurrection right now. The gospel isn't just good news for later. It's good news for right now. The gospel means if you're to Christ, eternity has already started for you. It's not someday. It's every day because we live in the power of the resurrection. And so it, it changes the way we see the world. It changes the way we see other people. It changes the way we see our family. It changes the way we work, the way we see challenges and obstacles. It changes our pursuits, our passions, and our ambitions. The gospel, see, it restores our relationship with God, which, which completely resets our relationship with the world. That we live for a different kingdom... And that brings greater joy and greater peace and greater purpose. Paul says the gospel is bearing fruit all over the world. It's taking root in people's lives. The gospel not only saves us as if that weren't enough, but it changes us. And Paul says, you guys, you Colossians, you are evidence of that. The gospel has changed you. You have been forgiven of the penalty of your sin. But you've also been set free from the power of your sin. Who you were is no longer who you are. That's the impact of the gospel. And he's going to get more into that in chapters 2 and 3. But in his opening remarks, he's just pouring on grace. He's pouring on praise. He just wants them to know of all of the good things that he has heard about them. And how did he hear it? He says, you learned this from Epaphras, our our dearly loved fellow servant. You learned this. Epaphras taught this gospel to you. He discipled you in the gospel of Jesus. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he has told us, he's reported to us, about your love in the Spirit. So now in verse 9, Paul's going to transition. He's going to move from praise to prayer. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, it's really interesting that Paul is praying for more knowledge because this is actually one of the heresies he's addressing within Gnosticism that says you need more knowledge. Is Paul contradicting himself? He is not. He is contrasting. He's contrasting. The knowledge you need is not more of man's wisdom. That's not going to lead you to life. The knowledge you need comes from God, his will, his wisdom, his understanding. That is the path to true life. You know the the self-help section in Barnes & Noble? You ever been into that section? Like it's the biggest oxymoron in the world. Because if self could help self, then the cross was a complete waste. We can't help ourselves. Man's wisdom has a ceiling. Politicians and presidents can't save us. Everything we need for salvation and human flourishing is found in Jesus. You will not find it in a book. You will not find it in a seminar. You will not find it in a degree, in a job, in a person, or a president. It is only found in Jesus. Peter said in in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, His divine power has given us everything required, everything required for life and for godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us for his own glory and goodness. Jesus has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through the knowledge of him. Paul says, uh, he's praying for gospel knowledge. He says, I want you to know God's wisdom and God's will. Why? Well, so that you can answer every question in small group? Is that why? Like so you can rock it out on Bible trivia? So, you can, so that you can impress people with your, with your Bible knowledge? Nope. So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of the kingdom of God, 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. (sighs) It's a long sentence. Filled with a lot of good stuff. I want you to know God's will so that you can walk well. Like that's what's going to help you navigate the challenges in this world. That, that's what's going to give you strength when you face the hard things in this world. That's, that's what's going to give you patience through suffering. That's what's going to give you endurance through all the difficult obstacles you're going to walk through. That's what's going to give you joy in spite of all the junk that's going to be thrown in your face. You are going to be able to walk in light no matter how dark it gets because that's what the wisdom of God provides. That is the gospel. And that's what changes us. It's not our wisdom. It's not our power. It's not our glorious might. It's his. And that's the only thing that's going to change the world we're living in. Listen, we're all sick of the mess. We're all sick of the mess. We're sick of mass shootings and we're sick of racism and sick of division and sick of polarization and sick of political corruption and man's wisdom is not enough to fix it. It's, It's not strong enough, good enough, or sufficient enough to be the solution to the brokenness in our world. And, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of wisdom in man. We've, we've done a lot of great things. We've managed to create lots of amazing things. But nothing we create, nothing we do will fix the brokenness in this world. Only Jesus is sufficient enough for that. The gospel is the only way back to God's design for human flourishing. The gospel is the only way back to God's design for human flourishing. And here's the good news. God has already made a way. He's already made a way. Verse 13. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. See, God's mission on earth was not to give us a holiday to celebrate. It was a rescue mission to rescue us from darkness and death. We were completely lost and hopeless, but Jesus came and he pulled us out of darkness into his marvelous light, but he didn't just pull us out and go, hey, good luck. Go get them. He didn't just pull us out. He transferred us over. He transferred us over into the kingdom of Jesus, which means we're no longer citizens of this world. We're just visitors here. We've been given this new home with a brand new identity. So while we live here, our lives aren't rooted here. We're rooted in the kingdom of God and defined by kingdom values. And while the world might discourage us, it does not define us. Because we've been transferred out of the world and into the kingdom of God. And so everything that's true of Jesus is true of us. Jesus is beloved by the Father, and so are we. Jesus is connected to the Father, and so are we. Jesus has been given authority over sin and death through his resurrection, and so have we. Do you understand that? See, if you are in Christ today, that means Christ is in you. Which means you are not stuck where you are. You are not stuck in your sin. You're just choosing not to move. There's a way out. And God has made it very clear. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God with all of the rights and the privileges thereof. There is power available to you in the kingdom 
to overcome sin in your life, you are not stuck in your selfishness. You are not stuck in your addiction. You are not stuck in your anger. You are not stuck in your pride. You are not stuck in your lust. You are not stuck in your greed. You are not stuck in your sin. Because in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let that sink in. So if you came in today feeling stuck, my friends, if you're in Christ, there's a way out. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. That is the gospel. If you're in him, you're not defined by your sin. You're redeemed by it. You're not stuck in it. You're forgiven of it so you can move out of it. You have resurrection power. That is good news. Now, here's the bad news. If you're not in Christ today, that's not true for you. It's not true for you. You, you, you can only move so far. Man's wisdom and self-help is all you got. But it is not sufficient for what you need. You will come up short every single time. Jesus is the only solution. He's the only one that can rescue you. The only one that can transfer you. The only one that can redeem you. The only one that can forgive you. And it's an easy trade. He says, just give your life to me. I'll fill in the gap. And so all you have to do is surrender your life to Jesus. You confess him as Lord, going, God, I've tried to be Lord, but that hasn't worked. And so I'm just giving this over to you because your ways are good and right. And so you repent of your sin. Repentance is, I'm moving this direction. Now I'm changing my mind. I'm going this direction because that direction is not working. That's what Paul did on the road to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus. He meets Jesus and literally turns around. And he gives his life to Jesus and writes half of the New Testament. So when you do that, when you surrender to Jesus, the Holy Spirit does the rest. You, you, and you can just rest. That's the gospel. And if you're ready to receive that, we'll have elders down front at the end of our service who would love to have that conversation with you or, or you can go on our next steps page and, and click on the box that says, I'm ready to follow Jesus and someone from our team will get back to you and have that conversation. And, and if that's where you are, you've already done that, you're ready to follow Jesus, well, your next step is baptism. Just like Paul did. And Baptism Sunday is next Sunday, and you can register for that on our website, and we'll celebrate that with you next Sunday. And for those of you who've already done that, many of you in this room, have you've surrendered to Jesus, you've been following Jesus, we're going to take communion right now, which is our weekly reminder of our standing in Christ, that the, the power of the gospel has rescued us, has transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves, has redeemed us, and has forgiven us of our sins. If you need a packet, you can raise your hand. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that the gospel is enough. We thank you that Jesus is supreme and that Jesus is sufficient for our salvation and everything else we need in this life to live a fruitful and abundant life as we wait for the hope of heaven. Thank you for the cross. We bow our knee to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen.